shouldn't be passive witnesses of the Lord's Supper. We should be actively engaged in um, the, t the time of the baptism in, 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 in uh, d doing the kind of self-examination that will um, that can build on the, the, the fact of our baptism uh, and, and it becomes then a tool for our own sanctification. So question number 20, what is the Lord's Supper and why are we to observe it? All right, our Lord Jesus, in the night wherein he was betrayed, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood called the Lord's Supper to be observed in his church under the end of the world for the perpetual remembrance of the sacrifice of himself in his death, the sealing of the benefits thereof unto true believers, their spiritual nourishment and growth in him, their further engagement in and to all duties which they owe unto him and to be a bond and pledge of their communion with him and with each other as members of his mystical body. Um, so it's a, it's a very rich opening definition. Well, what is it? Um, you know, it's a, it's a remembrance. It, uh, it has this sealing function. It is spiritual <laughs> nourishment, spiritual food for our souls. Um, as part of its sealing function, it's a time in which we recommit ourselves, our further engagement in and to all duties. Um, it is a bond and pledge of, their, of our communion with him and each other as m members of the mystical body. That's covenantal. You know, we are members of the covenant and it's a reminder of our covenantal connection with him in the new covenant in Christ and therefore with, with each other as well. So it's a multi-layered uh, definition of the Lord's Supper. Um, uh, why, are, why are we to observe it? Um, let's keep reading. In this sacrament, Christ is not offered up to his Father, nor any real sacrifice made at all for remission of sins of the quick or the dead, but only a commemoration of that one offering up of himself. So clearly we're dealing with Roman Catholicism, which are saying all of this, that a real sacrifice is made. It is called a propitiatory sacrifice. The Mass is called a propitiatory sacrifice in, at, in, the, in the, the Articles of Trent. But only a commemoration of that one offering up of himself. So there, there, were, there we're drawing on the language of, of the book of Hebrews. Once, once for all, the once for all sacrifice of Christ. He offered up himself one time for, for all. So that, that language is repeated over and over. It's at the bottom of this page. Uh, uh, if you have your catechism books, Hebrews 9, 22, 25 to 26, 28. Hebrews 10, 10 through 14, and so forth and so on. Um, so offering up of himself, by himself upon the cross, once for all, and a spiritual oblation of all possible praise unto God for the same. So that the popish sacrifice of the mass, as they call it, is most abominably injurious to Christ, one only sacrifice, the alone propitiation for all the sins of all the elect. Why is it abominably injurious? Mr. Yes. Jesus, David. Um, is it because it kind of implies that his sacrifice on the cross it worked, and then it only until the next time you have to do a mass, and the next time, the next time, like it wasn't, it didn't really work. Yes. Well, it strikes it strikes at the the efficacy of this of the once for all sacrifice for one thing. This thing has to be repeated. So the the finality of and and therefore the value of Christ's death is being undermined. It's being cheapened. So that, it's abominably injurious to the once-for-all sacrifice. Was that once-for-all efficacious for all people for all time? Or, or does it, is it in need of constant repetition in the Mass for that efficacy to continue? So the, the repeating of the sacrifice over and over and over 
again undermines our understanding of the value, of the worth, of the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice itself. So, so in that way, it is abominably injurious. Um, and then, as, as you say, if every time you sin, you, you lose the efficacy of it, and then you have to go back and get sacraments so that you can um, re-energize or re-effectualize it, again, that, that cheapens the, the value of the sacrifice. It, it greatly trivializes and minimizes Jesus' saying, it is finished, mm -hmm. to, to simply meaning my life is over, I'm done, I'm done for. <coughs> Um, where what he was saying was what the work of the redemption that I've come to do is done. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. it's interesting. It's a low view of the atonement, which is the common uh, downfall of well, or sin, I, uh, the false belief of the Jehovah's Witnesses as well. Low view of the atonement. Yeah. Um, yeah, the same sin, problem with the Sin. Is not that important. Isn't it also like offensive that you're if you're viewing it that way that you're crucifying Christ again? Mm -hmm. Every time? Um, you're actually performing the sacrifice. So they will deny that they are re sacrificing. Um, they really react very negatively to that. But so they're not re sacrificing, but they are nevertheless drawing upon that sacrifice and actually offering that sacrifice again on an altar. So it's being re-energized, re-effectualized, re-presented. It's hard to find the right language for what's going on. Okay, back to question number 20. Here's the way I answer it. What, what is the Lord's Supper? It's a covenantal meal. So it's called the Lord's Supper, it's called the Lord's Table, it's called the New Covenant in my blood. So here we see the language of meal, right, table, supper. Uh, number two, it's a spiritual meal. It's a, again, this is the language of section one, spiritual nourishment. Uh, we get spiritual food, we get spiritual drink. Um, it's it's a symbolic meal. Uh, you know you're not you're not you get symbols of body and blood. Um, you're not going to get full on those small morsels of bread and the small bit of drink that you get. So it's a uh, it's both spiritual and symbolic, um, and it's a communal meal. It's the bond and pledge of our communion. The idea of private communion uh, that's rejected. You know, you go to some weddings. Um, in fact, my, one of my nephews, they had a, they, they, had, they served communion at his wedding while all the rest of us watched. But that was rather bizarre. That's common. Just a couple. Yeah. The couple is served communion while everybody else just watching. It's almost like it, it's a seal. It makes it more special. It does make it more special. That's the whole point, right? It makes it more special. As if marriage is special. All by itself. I, yeah, so. So, and what about like taking communion to shut ins with elders? Um, uh, the confession is going to argue against any private administration. So, unless you can understand them participating with the in other words, we would never do it except in connection with it being administered here. And then we would take what was administered here and take it to them um, and, again, go through the words, of the, the words again. I'm, um, and frankly, we haven't done it for about 25 years. But we did, we, we did it some when I first got here because it was customary. But I'm pretty uncomfortable with it. They don't get the benefit of well with in, you know with the live stream now. I mean I don't I don't know. It's a new world, but at least then they they are getting the benefit of the sermon. They're getting benefit of the the exhortation, the fencing of the table, the reading of the scripture. They're getting all the benefit. Can you then take it to them, as though they were there? Because at least online they were there. 
Next question. <laughs> uh, number four, it's a memorial meal. It's a perpetual remembrance. So we make emphatic that it is a meal, and that's why we have tables. That's why the tables go down the center on the, the quarterly communions and across the front, and communion table is always present uh, at the front uh, of the church uh, because we are emphasizing this is a meal. It is a covenantal meal. It's a spiritual meal. It's a communal meal. It's a memorial meal, but it is a meal. It's not a mass. So that is emphatic. It's a supper. It's not a sacrifice. That's the biblical language. Uh, also, question um, number 20, um, what it is not. It is not a sacrifice. Theologically, all right, there's an appeal to the finality of the atonement, and here are the passages. It is finished, and then this once-for-all language in... Um, Hebrews 9 and 10, and then 1 Peter 3, 18, he died once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Once for all, the finality of it, the sufficiency of it, the adequacy of it. So theologically, a, a proper understanding of the atonement makes, a sacri that may, makes uh, the understanding of, 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 the, of the supper as a sacrifice impossible. I think if you have a proper understanding of the nature of the atonement, the efficacy of the atonement, the finality of the atonement, you cannot understand the Lord's Supper to be a sacrifice. It's disqualified. Then go exegetically to the words. This is my body. I mean, Zwingli, going back to the 1520s, has just has a, he, he has a, a riot with this. This is my body. This is the blood of the new covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Are we to understand that the cup, the cup itself, becomes the blood of Christ? Because Jesus' words of institutions are, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So does the, is the cup transubstantiated? It, why, why, why would we not understand this language metaphorically, just like when Jesus says, I am the door? We don't, we don't think of him having a handle and hinges, uh, swinging um, on those hinges. Uh, it's obviously metaphorical language. He is in present with the disciples. They are there. He is speaking to them when he says, this is my body. He can't be understood anything but metaphorically. It represents his body. It symbolizes his body. That's the, you know, you talk about the literal understanding, and again, you got Luther pounding the table, but to, to say that the literal, under, natural versus literal, the literal understanding of the word, this is my body, is this. That the accidents of the bread and of the wine remain unchanged. But the substance is transformed into the substance of his body and of his blood. Okay, that, that's, that, that's a literal understanding? Really? In what way is that literal? Um, we, we, we have to use Aristotle's philosophy and the categories that he created that distinguish accidents from substance in order to understand the meaning of the Lord's Supper. That's the... The literal, no, the natural reading of his words is it's metaphorical language. Obviously it is. Particularly when his body is literally present in front of them intact. Yes. That's the time he is saying yes. this. Yes, and, then, and then, he, then, then Zwingli goes on and he says, so are we to understand that when we are chewing the bread that we are masticating veins and arteries and flesh and uh, skin and bones, um, of, of course not. It's, this is metaphorical language. It's, and that, so, so that over against a literal, so-called literal meaning, what's the, what's the natural meaning? It's natural meaning? It's metaphor. Of course it is. This is my body. This bread is my body. It <coughs> represents my body. Not that it becomes my body. Not, 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 not that the accidents remain unchanged and the substance becomes the substance of my flesh. No, that's not the natural meaning. So the arguments of the Reformed Church are both theological and exegetical. The th 
theology is you've undermined the sufficiency of the death of Christ. You have devalued it. You have not understand its adequacy, its sufficiency, its efficacy. And exegetically, you're just completely misunderstanding. You're misinterpreting Jesus' words. Sorry. Yes. How does the, the fact that we're talking about taking for granted if we have communion weekly versus monthly or quarterly, how do we relate to the fact that we say the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, um, every week? For the communion, I'm not sorry, not the communion, but ten commandments. We say those every week. We don't take those for granted. How does that differ? Are we putting the communion up here on a higher level? Well, in the in in the Reformed tradition, okay, let's back up. How often did um, lay people take communion in the in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance, leading into the Reformation? Anybody know? Once a year. The common practice was once a year for the laity. So you start from there, and at the very least, the Reformation is instituting quarterly communion. So it goes from once a year to four times a year. Um, I, think the, I think that the evolving opinion of the Reformed Church was that it was far more important to observe the Lord's Supper carefully than frequently. And, and so there has been a preference uh, for less frequent than weekly rather than um, weekly itself. Um, so there's been, monthly has been the practice at times, uh, quarterly has been the practice at times. There are some uh, who have even argued for yearly, drawing from the Passover example. And the fact of the matter is that uh, in the, the New Testament does not say anything about frequency. And, and so it's really, it's a prudential matter again. What, what best uh, serves the people of God at any, at any given time? And so w when I got here, it was quarterly in the morning. And so we added the eight other months in the evening. And so we have it every month now. I thought that, you know, the directory says frequently. It should be administered frequently. I, if you missed one when it was quarterly. Quarterly, by the way, is the practice everywhere with um, congregation, basically, Congregational Baptists and Presbyterian churches. Some of the New England churches had monthly. But basically, Baptists, it was quarterly. Baptist church, I grew up quarterly. That was common. Presbyterians, quarterly. You miss once, you go six months without the Lord's Supper. That, to me, is not frequently by any rational um, you know, consideration. Um, so, um, so what is it? It's not a sacrifice, number two. It does not convey physical presence. Um, so that there is a, um, a refutation of both transubstantiation and consubstantiation. Um, so let's, let's read on and let's see how this is done. Uh, paragraph 3, the Lord Jesus hath in this ordinance appointed his ministers, there again, clergy-led, to declare his word of institution to the people to pray and bless the elements of the bread and wine and thereby to set them apart from a common to a holy use and to take and break the bread, to take the cup, and they communicating also themselves to give both to the communicants um, but to none who are not then present, there you go, none who are not then present in the congregation. Uh, for private masses or receiving the sacrament by a priest or any other alone, as likewise the denial of the cup to the people. Okay, for a thousand years, uh, the laity had been denied the cup from 5th century to 15th. 16th century, until the Re Reformation, the laity were not allowed the cup. Now, the Eastern Church, they, they did receive the cup, but not the Western Church. So this is, this is a repudiation of that, withholding the cup from the laity. Yes? Why the cup and not the bread? Because the clumsy lay people would spill it. 
um, worshiping the elements, lifting them up. Um, so one reason why we would not lift up the cup, though I've seen Protestant ministers do it and they shouldn't, was because of the symbolism of that. It was lifted up and the people would bow down. It was lifted up so that the, the now consecrated blood of Christ, um, Christ uh, is now physically present in his body and blood, and so you lift the elements and the people then bow and worship because of that physical presence. Yes. Uh, related to the consecration thing, in the third section it says, thereby set them apart from a common to a holy use in reference to the bread and wine. Is consecration a word that we would use for that, like for that setting apart, or would we try to keep that away from using the term consecration so as not to think that we were like turning it into Jesus? Um, well, we have to actually have a prayer of consecration. I don't know if you've noticed. Yeah, we are. Uh, consecration just means you're setting aside for holy use. So I'm, I'm okay with the word. So you hold the cup up just high enough so everybody can see. That's it. <laughs> yeah. You don't lift it up so that they can uh, perform acts of adoration. Um, uh, lifting them up or carrying them about for adoration and receiving them for any pretended religious use are all contrary to the nature of the sacrament and to the institution of Christ. The outward elements in this sacrament duly set apart to, that, to the uses ordained by Christ have such relation to him crucified as that truly, yet sacramentally only, they are sometimes called by the name of things they represent to wit, the body and blood of Christ. Is it right to speak of the body and blood of Christ? Yes. Um, and is there this sacramental connection between the two? Yes. Does that mean that that, there, that, that is, is to be understood physically, so that there is a physical, localized, carnal presence of Christ in the bread and in the cup? No. Albeit in substance and nature, they still remain truly and only bread and wine as they were. No, no alteration of the substance. Uh, the doctrine which maintains a change of the substance of the bread and wine into the substance of Christ's body and blood, commonly called transubstantiation by consecration of a priest, Ben, there's your hesitation with the word, um, or by any other way is repugnant not only to scripture alone, but even to common sense. Okay, there you've got Zwingli having us chewing veins and bones and ligaments and um, but and reason overthroweth the nature of the sacrament uh, which is as a, 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 a covenantal meal and hath been and is the cause of manifold superstitions yea of gross idolatries pretty strong stuff uh, so you can't you can't have a be horrible to have a rat uh, come around later and pick up a Don't want that to happen. And the priest has to finish off all of the uh, wine right. as well because mm -hmm. yeah, that can't be sitting around either. So you've got to. I had a friend in a town college. He's a he's now in scenario to become an Orthodox priest. But he told me that they would they spilled some one time and they cut up the carpet and burned it. Yeah, they burn it. Yeah, they spill it on the carpet. They burn it. Uh, worthy receivers outwardly partaking of the visible elements in the sacrament do then also inwardly by faith. Really, okay, that word will only be used adverbally. It's the Catholics and the Lutherans who talk about a real meaning physical. So, Reformed people have always avoided using the word real in connection with presence, but they will use the adverb. He's really present, but it's not a real presence, meaning it's not a physical presence. So, really and indeed, yet not carnally, or corporally, that is not physically, but spiritually, receive and feed upon Christ crucified and all the benefits of his death. So, you know, there, there is efficacy here. There is blessing here. There is benefit that comes by partaking of the Lord's Supper. That doesn't mean that we must conceive of this taking place carnally, corporally, uh, or in any kind of a physical sense. The body and blood of Christ then being, again, it's repeated. So if you didn't get the message, not corporally, 
or carnally, in, with, or under the bread and the wine. Who's that? Luther. That's Luther. So that's uh, con. So here's transubstantiation. This is consubstantiation. Um, in, with, and under. So Luther wants to maintain a physical presence. Once again, he says he's taking the words literally. This is my body, this is my blood. How do you explain the body and blood? Well, there is his real body and blood. They are physically, carnally, locally present in, in <coughs> with, and under. So that's literal, huh? That, that's a literal understanding of this is. It's so contrived. It's on a fence. Mm -hmm. It also denies the incarnation. We, there is a glorified man in heaven at the right hand of the Father today. Yes, and reform. He, he's not there on the plate. Reform Protestants argue that a, this view requires us to believe in the ubiquity of the physical presence of Christ, which is denied the humanity of the body. Where is Christ? Is he somewhere? Yes. His physical presence is at the right hand of the Father. It's not here. In fact, that's what, how do you understand John 17 and Jesus closing the, and the whole upper room discourse? And Jesus is, I, you know, I am leaving you. Another Comforter will come. Is did He leave us? Is He physically absent from us? Isn't that the point of you know John 14 through 17 that He is going to be physically absent from us? Um, yes. Earlier uh, in the uh, weeks prior, you mentioned Calvin's view using those words truly or really and how it's really, truly, spiritually present, but it sounded kind of more confusing than it was helpful. What That's a good question that? for the exam. Uh, <laughs> what was? Um, so, Reformed people talk about a true presence. Calvin never uses real presence. Okay, neither do Reformed theologians, pastors, ever since. We avoid the language of real presence because the Lutherans and Catholics mean something entirely different that we cannot endorse. But we will speak of it adverbially. He is really present in that sense. Yeah, he's really there, but it's a spiritual presence. He's really there spiritually. That is a true presence. It's a true presence, and he is really present spiritually. So I'll, take, I'll go one further. In other words, really modifies spiritual. Yes. Yeah. And you yeah. wouldn't say his spiritual presence is real and not real. <laughs> yeah, we just we just I think it's I think it's been wise to avoid that language yeah. lest we confuse people. Um, I think Calvin is is baffling. I do not understand him yeah. on the Lord's Supper. So I I read a lot of this in, in <coughs> ten years ago. Zwingli and Calvin. And I don't think there's a hair's breadth difference between Zwingli and Calvin. If people say there is, Zwingli's a memorialist, and I, I, I don't think so. I think the one thing that I would distinguish is that Calvin is very emphatic that the whole Christ is present in the supper in the fullness of his humanity and divinity spiritually. Yeah, spiritually. And Zwingli is sure that the, that the Christ in the fullness of his divinity he doesn't de deny the other. He just hasn't, I don't think he has thought that far ahead. Calvin's second generation reformer. Zwingli's first generation, and he's saying Christ and the fullness of his divinity is present in the supper. Yes. Do the continental uh, confessions, do they recognize Calvin's view or more ours, like the three forms? How do they? Yeah, they're Calvin. I, I mean, they're, yeah, good question. Uh, I, th I think, I think that the Dutch uh, would would be consistent with Westminster. I, I think I think you know you know Cal, uh, William Cunningham, the great 19th century Scottish theologian, just says I, he just he and Hodge both Charles Hodge, the great 19th century American, they both just say we don't understand Calvin because at times he sounds like he's a Roman Catholic, but we know he's not. But at times he sounds like it. So. Uh, anyway, back to the Lutherans. So he's re really, there's your really, Jackson, but spiritually. Really, but spiritually present. 
uh, to the faith of believers in that ordinance as the elements themselves are to their outward senses. Although ignorant and wicked men receive the outward elements in the sacrament, yet they receive not the things signified thereby, but by their unworthy coming thereunto are guilty of the body and blood of the Lord to their own damnation. Wherefore, all ignorant and ungodly persons, as they are unfit to enjoy communion with him, so they are unworthy of the Lord's table and cannot, without great sin against Christ, while they remain such, partake of these holy mysteries or be admitted <coughs> thereunto. And so you will hear us every time we administer the Lord's Supper, we do what we refer to as fencing the table. You fence it. You say, if you are not a Christian believer, if you are not a member in good standing in an evangelical church, if you are a member but you are walking in defiance and disobedience and indulging in ungodliness and in rebellion, do not partake. And then we read the words of warning that are in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to the end and uh, warn them of eating and drinking judgment to themselves. William? Um, is there any provision for uh, those who physically cannot consume the elements of communion, such as gluten intolerance? Um, we tried that a couple of times and then, and then quit doing it. Because I have one, I have a very close friend of mine that cannot take communion for that exact reason. And, and uh, yeah, I, uh, that little morsel, is that? Uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. That, that will do, that'll trigger it, huh? That little bit. Yeah, some, some people have celiac, so mm -hmm. they, that's serious but for some folks. My wife, she just, she thought she had that, but she just takes a little bit. She's a, okay. Okay. I, on the fencing of the table, I visited uh, probably about 10 years ago a Lutheran Missouri Senate church. And we fence the table that you speak from the front if you're this, this, or if you're not this, don't partake. They met me at the door. You're a visitor. Wonderful. Where are you from? You're not LCMS, please don't partake. Because yeah. they, they're fencing the table as if you are not of their synod, mm -hmm. you are not to partake. You can be a member of another church, but it has to be LCMS. Yeah, so I, I, I went to a Wisconsin synod. I think I mentioned this uh, previously. Yeah. And the same, same deal. You had to have like a letter from your church validating your claim to be a member of the Wisconsin Synod Lutherans. And of course, we weren't, so we watched communion, but I, I left saying, these people are awesome. You know, They're so negative and so narrow and so restrictive. It's just wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> just, we didn't know these kind of people existed anymore. Um, but, you know, they have their convictions that this is, you know, it's meant to be for that church community only, and, you know, so they don't apologize for it. They, well, and, and the concern is the same. Unworthy reception, and if you're not part of that, their group, their concerns. We, we, we are protecting you from yourself. Yes. Yeah. Mm. The Orthodox Church makes, I've heard, a similar, uh, not necessarily in terms of this, but in terms of like salvation, where the statement might be say, said, uh, we, we, we know where the church is, but we don't know where the church is not. I was trying to understand if, if church membership was a foundation for our salvation. All right, just to make sure that we were all getting this. The Roman Catholic view is transubstantiation. Lutheran view is consubstantiation. The Baptist view, um, <coughs> Matthew, in your, in, your, in, this, in your understanding, is this still typical amongst most Baptists that it's a, just a memorial? In fact, they don't even, they reject the use of the word sacrament. Well, that is true, ordinance over sacrament. But I haven't been a part of a real Baptist church in probably 50 years. So, and so what I practice and taught would have been more what we know here. That's not it, fair. I, I'm wondering because so many Baptist churches have gone with Presbyterian church government. They are independent Presbyterians, in effect. 
in their church government. They have elders now instead of being run by deacons and one elder who is the minister. So I wondered if there's been an evolving view of the sacraments as well. Um, because again, what they came out of was congregationalism where you have the Westminster view amongst congregationalists, and so that would have been the Baptist view. They would have had uh, the congregational church government, they would have had congregational view of the Lord's Supper, but the different view of baptism. So you just, you know, I just, I just still wonder about where things stand. All right, so we've answered 20 and we've answered 21. Um, uh, how is the Lord's Supper to be observed? Question number 22. Um, How's this for an answer? It's to be administered by ministers. It's to be administered publicly. The words of institution are to be read. The elements are to be set apart by prayer. Consecrated. Uh, elements distributed to those present. The cup is not to be withheld from the laity. The elements are not to be elevated and adored. Elements are not to be reserved. definition of reserved here somewhere. Um, the storing of consecrated elements for some future pretended and undoubtedly superstitious use. Um, six, the wicked are to be excluded. And if, you, if you're interested, you can go to the directory for worship for direction and content of the opening exhortation, the invitation to the sacraments, the fencing of the table, the prayer of thanksgiving, and the consecration of the elements. So again, the directory for worship is filling out what, the, um, what they meant by some of the language that we find in the confession. So my favorite little chart, what is it? It is a meal, not a mass. It is a supper, not a sacrifice. It's a table, not an altar, administered by a pastor, not a priest. You see the consistency of all this, right? If it's a sacrifice, well, then that's an altar and that's a priest. This is why, um, in some ways, the decisive, the dis in some ways, the decisive doctrine of the Reformation is your view of the Lord's Supper. The ramifications just multiply, because but, because look, the, this all makes sense. If it's a sacrifice, that's an altar. That's a priest. Um, if it's a meal. That's a supper, that's a table, that's a pastor. So the job description of the clergy changes at the time of the Reformation. You're not a priest offering a sacrifice on an altar. You're a pastor and a preacher. Um, the, the interior design of the church changes. You don't have an altar as a focal point. You have a pulpit uh, for the sake of the ministry of the word, the ongoing, um, you know, the ongoing nutrition of the people of God, and, and, and the, 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 the piece of furniture is a table. So you have, you have an alteration of the interior design of the church. You have an alteration of the job description of the clergy, all tied into your understanding of the theology of the supper. So it, it has a, a real dynamic impact. Um, 23, explain what is involved in worthily partaking of the Lord's Supper a, uh, before, during, and after doing so. If you looked at larger catechism 170 to 175, you'd see the a seriousness. Okay, going back to what, we, what I said at, at the beginning, we have been in favor of careful rather than frequent administration of the Lord's Supper. It's to be observed with intensity. So you, you have communion seasons. Now that was true in Scotland, it was true in Holland, it was true in colonial America, communion seasons. Those are the forerunners of the camp, grant, the camp meetings that uh, followed in the 19th century from which then uh, the sacraments were uh, severed, they were eliminated, but you, you go, there's a direct lineage from the communion seasons where, where you would have services starting midweek, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, then the Sunday communion, Sunday night Thanksgiving, Monday night Thanksgiving. Um, so c careful um, observance. And so this is, the, the larger catechism is directing us um, to, to take care before the communion service, during the communion service, after the communion service. That's careful. It's an intense observance of the Lord's Supper. So our, our tradition, uh, right or wrong, I mean, there, there's no, 
let me, let me clarify. There's no principled objection to weekly communion. And uh, there are Presbyterian churches that do. Calvin was an advocate of it. There's no principled objection. The objection is that if it's every Sunday, it's going to be, it's not going to be carefully observed. My anecdotal evidence is everywhere I have gone, almost without exception, where there's weekly communion, it's been rushed in, in Presbyterian churches. Okay, so you end up with you end up with something, something gets compromised because you can't have a Presbyterian sermon, which is going to be a half an hour, face it. I mean, any church worth its salt, any preacher worth it, he's going to preach for half an hour. I mean, if you're an Episcopalican, yeah, you have a 15-minute sermon, 10-minute sermon, they don't care. That's why when we had the kirking of the tartans, the Episcopalians were wiggling all over the pews <laughs> 15 minutes into the sermon. Uh, they, they were so unaccustomed to anything beyond, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. But if you have a half an hour sermon and you have the, you know, the proper elements of the service leading into it, and you're reading scripture and you've got prayers and all of that, and then you do the Lord's Supper, it's an hour and a half. To do it right, it's going to be an hour and a half. So um, are churches willing to do that and have Sunday school? So you have Sunday school before, so you get in here at 9 o'clock. You have Sunday school for an hour, it's 10 o'clock. You have the service, it's you know, 11 o'clock, 11.30. Or most churches where it's 11 o'clock and then 9.30 Sunday school like it used to be here. And so it's, you know, it's, it's at least 12.30. You've been here, you've been here th three hours. I mean, I'm just saying that they don't, they don't do it. They rush it. That's why intinction became popular. So you get it all done real quickly. You come forward and you dip your little bread in the cup and you get it all at once. And you know you can file right through. And and uh, and I, I mentioned previously the carelessness of it all, the carelessness of it, where you know, everybody's talking about where they're going to go have uh, lunch after the service while they're in line to receive the elements of communion. They're not they're not focusing at all on a careful observance of the Lord's Supper. They're not worried about eating and drinking judgment. They're worrying about what they're going to order for lunch. So, so, um, and so, so even if they're not doing intinction, the whole thing is rushed. It's a very nominal fencing of the table. It's very quickly done. Why? So that it's all done in an hour and a quarter. And, and so I think you have to rework the whole. I, I, I would have weekly communion if we didn't have Sunday school, maybe. I think we should have Sunday school. It's an established practice. <coughs> Um, I, I, I think it, that's open to challenge. I think that can be argued against, but I don't, I don't see how you do it right um, and, and, and do it with care and with focus and, and, and attention and, and intensity. I don't see how you do that um, and, and not end up with people in church you know, all, all morning long uh, unless you, you got to eliminate something. In my view, you got to eliminate something. Yes. Um, on the other hand, I, I was part of a church that was maybe 25 or 30 people that this particular church celebrated the Lord's Supper every week. And because it was a small church, there were only a few people. It did not add to the length of the service unnecessarily. Um, so I think size, you know, again, a wisdom issue, a practical issue. And going back to your earlier question, the uh, London Baptist Confession has the exact same language in the first paragraph of the uh, chapter on the Lord's Supper, a uh, spiritual nourishment and growth in Him. So there's no memorial uh, emphasis. Yeah, yeah. With, with I that. suspect that that was the case because the the lineage. But I talked to kids at, at Veritas, some of my students, and say, "What does the Lord's Supper mean?" And you tell where they come from by how they answer. It's a, it's a yeah. memorial. Yeah, so just to remind us, the Westminster Confession spins off the Savoy Declaration, which is the Westminster Confession almost unaltered except on church government. The Savoy then spins off the London Confession of 1689, almost exactly Savoy, which is almost exactly Westminster, except the change in baptism and the congregational changes as well in um, church government. Yes. Uh, when did churches start practicing having like grape juice or something like that instead of wine? Well, that's really interesting. In this church, there were two votes around the turn of the century to replace the wine with grape juice. So you have a really powerful prohibition movement because of 
the abuse of alcohol that was of epidemic proportions. I don't think we are still up to the per capita consumption of alcohol that was, um, uh, that was uh, characteristic at the turn of the, of the 20th century. We have such more exciting things now. <laughs> Maybe so. Uh, but but there, there was, they talked about the, you know, the gin plague. And uh, so it was a terrible, terrible thing. And there, the, the prohibition was not an, uh, a, a moderation, but a prohibition. Uh, another practical reason at that same time is uh, refrigeration. I mean, the grape juice doesn't last without refrigeration. That, that's, that's true as well. So there were two votes in which they did, voted against. Once the, isn't it the Comstead Act was passed, they had a third vote. Uh, and they voted to replace it with grape juice. Um, so I think, I think the cultural momentum was such that alcohol was removed and was replaced with, um, with, the, with the juice. And, and, and just to defend what we still do, the language in the words of institution is not oinos, which is the Greek word for wine. It's fruit of the vine. So, so you know, you want to get technical about it? It's, it's fruit of the vine. It's not wine. And it, 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 unfermented fruit of the wine qualifies as well as fermented. You might say, well, for 1,900 years, it was always fermented. And that seems inconsistent with your near idolatrous attachment to historical practice, to which I say, guilty. All right. <laughs> so, so is it, is it Presbyterian as a whole that does grape juice? You, you reference the Comstead Act, or is, it, or is that this congregation? I think almost that? all Presbyterian churches until the, maybe the 1990s and the younger guys coming through the seminaries, uh, evangelical churches nationwide, Baptists, all evangelical churches everywhere use grape juice. But that started to change, I would say, sometime in the 1990s. To go back to the wine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or, and, and, and the PCA churches that I have attended around, they offer both. And they'll have an inner circle that's grape juice or and an outer circle <coughs> that's wine or the, or the reverse. Um, how many questions do you have on your? Um, I, 24. Okay, twenty-four is prayer. So there, prayer is not dealt with at length in the confession, but it is in the catechism. So if you remember, in this section, we were looking at the the three primary means of grace. The ministry of the word is treated in the catechism. The sacraments are treated in the confession. Prayer is treated in the catechisms as well with a lengthy exposition of the Lord's Prayer. So prayer is not neglected. And, you know, that's why I say you have to look at all these documents together to really get the feel for what, they're, what they are principally, prin uh, principally um, advocating. Uh, so you have a directory for worship standing behind all, the, all that's said about worship. You have a directory of church government behind all that's said about church government. You have a directory for discipline about, uh, behind the section on the censures. And you have the catechisms with their lengthy exposition of the ministry of the word and prayer. Okay, we're out of time. Very good. Um, we're back again tomorrow night, same time, same place. So sorry we had to double up. I just totally mismanaged my calendar, and that's where we are. Scotty? Yeah, I, I want to touch on 23C. What, what is the wording for taking the Lord's Supper after the Lord's You would go away from it and further meditating upon what had taken place. Okay. And the, the catechism will direct you and tell you just exactly what you should be thinking about. Uh, the, the writers of the catechism would not be in favor of the fact that our people sit in the church, they hear the benediction, the preacher walks down the row, they sing the last hymn, and they, uh, uh, it's over, and they turn and say, hey, did you see the Georgia game last night? They would not be happy with you. They would say, you should be, you are um, sc scattering the seed that has been sown. You're not giving it time to take root by pondering and contemplating uh, the, the, the significance of what you've just heard. But if I said that from the pulpit, they would accuse me of being a legalist. All right, we got to go. Tomorrow, same time, same place. <laughs>